Paul Check, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on here today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for your interest in, in me and my work. Yeah, you're, I've been following your work for, I'm sure, much longer than uh, you are aware. I started my health journey in the late 90s, and um, I got into the fitness field um, not too much longer, probably around somewhere around 97, 98. And one of your books, actually, that you wrote back in 2004, I, I think I had heard your name before that, but I read How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, and it went beyond the typical dogma of a strength and conditioning professional or a nutritionist or a personal trainer. And that's when I started to realize that, you know, whether I was a personal trainer, strength and conditioning specialist, whatever it might be, that I can actually introduce greater concepts into people's life to not just transform their body, but actually their overall health and mind as well. So I appreciate it and want to thank you in person or at least over Zoom here for that. Well, my pleasure. I, I think that book's helped uh, more people than I can even imagine, <laughs> which is great. I get letters in the mail to this day. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing book. And I know that you created a second edition of that in 2018, I believe. Uh, so certainly I'll be talking about that in a moment as well. But before I do, just for people that have not heard of you, uh, and again, I, I reach out, I'd say more to uh, integrative health or functional medicine-based community, but we have a lot of people in the uh, personal training, sports space fair for without a doubt. So you've done, you've done obviously so much. You're an author, you're a speaker, consultant with, you know, professional teams, but you're also, you have a, you have a holistic side to you. You're, I believe a registered spirit guide, medicine man. I mean, there's so much that you've done over now, what, 30, 40 years that if someone is not familiar with your work, how do you even describe what it is that you do? Well, I'm a holistic health practitioner and my mother is a yogi and my father and mother were farmers. I was raised on a farm and pretty much the principles I learned to make a farm work, work perfectly for a human body. In fact, if you look into the requirements for A, what it takes to be a veterinarian, it takes higher education standards to be a veterinarian than it does to be a medical doctor for human beings. And if you look into the standards that are required for producing food for animals like dogs and cats, they're higher than the standards required for human food. And so really my foundation with my mother's uh, work and practice and teachings and uh, the training I got from the Self-Realization Fellowship through Paramahansa Yogananda's teachings as a child and the basics I learned from the farm and living off our farm um, and the first book I ever read in my life, cover to cover, I hated reading as a kid, but the first book to catch my attention enough to get me to read the whole 470 something pages was Nutrition, A Holistic Approach by Rudolph Ballantyne, MD. And so ultimately my license is as a holistic health practitioner. That's what I've devoted my life to. And that's what I feel is important. That's really the basis of my whole education system. And is that what you got into, right? I mean, you obviously, I mean, it seems like you had an amazing head start. You just learned so much more than the average American does because of your parents and your upbringing, where someone like myself, I had to learn that for the very first time when I was 17, 18 years old. I was brought up more on um, fruity pebbles and cereals and Kool-Aid and, and just never realized how what we put into our body actually affects our health. And most people, again, to this day don't. Did you enter the health-based sphere through the holistic teaching or did you get into it first with fitness? I got into it as an athlete. Um, I fought my way onto the army boxing team uh, when I was in the 82nd Airborne Division uh, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And at the same time I was training for triathlon, my company commander had gotten word from somebody who was in AIT, which is advanced individual training. I was in electronic school for almost a year because I used to repair weapon systems on Cobra helicopters. And I was setting all sorts of military records and winning piles of competitions in the military. And one of my buddies who got recruited into this company, the 82nd Combat Aviation Battalion, told my first sergeant, there's a guy who's coming. And I was actually scheduled to be put into another company, said, you got to get this guy because this guy's a great athlete and he can help us win competitions. So they made arrangements to have me transferred into their company specifically because the army triathlon was coming up and he wanted to get somebody in there that would represent aviation because aviation aviators are usually not very fit and they keep getting hammered by 
all the foot soldiers. So I actually trained for and represented the army. I won the army triathlon while I was fighting on the army boxing team. And mm. I became a, the United States army's representative at the 1986 national championships in Hilton head, South Carolina for USTS distance triathlons. So the, the, the boxing coaches and the boxers were all kind of mind boggled at how I could train six or seven hours a day as a fighter and train for triathlon and still fight hard and win boxing matches. So my company commander said to me, you know, if you don't want to box anymore and you want to train full time for triathlon, I'll let you do it because you win a lot and we like that. So I realized I wasn't going to turn pro in boxing so when I told the coaches I was going to leave and train full-time for triathlon, they said, oh, God, don't do that. We'll give you the job as the trainer because the way you eat and the way you train is obviously far superior to what we're doing. So why don't you stay here and you can just take over the conditioning programs, the nutrition, help manage the gym and the fighters, and spend the rest of your time training for triathlon. So that's how my career got started, and I was able to work with the team doctor who was an osteopathic physician for two years to learn how to take care of acute sports injuries, which we had lots of because the army boxing gym was also the headquarters for all army sports at Fort Bragg, which is quite a large post. There's 79,000 soldiers there when I was there and a lot of elite power lifters, track and field athletes, martial artists, the JFK, JFK warfare center was right across the street where they train all the green berets. So you had all the, all the bad boys coming in there and, I was just constantly interacting with all sorts of injured athletes. And at that time I was studying sports massage and just using Rich Fay's book, Athletic Massage and applying those principles to the fighters just intuitively and sort of sensing what needed to be done. And, and I was the first person in the army to ever use massage therapy for athletes which I got a lot of flack for because <laughs> they, they thought it, they, they kept calling me a, for touching bodies and stuff, but it, it was more, more joking than anything else, but it worked extremely well. And I put my nutrition approaches to work. Um, I also used a lot of weightlifting. I grew up weightlifting and uh, the boxers had a lot of fear about weightlifting because it had so many results of boxers getting slower when they got stronger, but they were using bodybuilding. So I taught them how to do proper weightlifting. When, when you couple proper weightlifting with uh, proper conditioning and proper diet and the science of rest, you get magic. And in the 1988 Olympics of the 12 boxers that were on the U S uh, boxing team, 11 of them came from my boxing team. Oh, I had no idea. That's, that's an amazing statistic right there. And obviously, um, not by chance. Tell me a little bit about, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the proper weightlifting where you switch people away from the bodybuilding, maybe single body part per day routines into what you train them, uh, to do. Well, part of the problem was they were using isolation training, a lot of machine training, and eight to 12 reps with one minute rest periods, which is all hypertrophy training. And what the athletes didn't realize is the body does not think in muscles. It thinks in movements. So the body really works with patterns of movement, which is why I developed my primal pattern movement system to show people that there's really seven key patterns of movement that are largely the sort of the archetypal template that we use to survive in nature. And so I also teach them the concept train slow, be slow. So if you use weights that are so heavy that you can barely move them and you're moving at slow speeds for too long, then your nervous system adapts to that rate of movement and you can be very strong, but very slow. So really what I did was a lot of circuit training, integrating calisthenic movements with complex movements, such as lunging while doing an overhead press or squatting till the dumbbells touch the ground. And as you stand up curling and pressing them over your head. So these were total body movements that they're very, very taxing. And they use every muscle in your body from your eyeballs to your toes. And so when you couple that with activities like uh, skipping rope and classic calisthenics exercises, and even things like the eight count push up 
which is a military exercise or it's a class a calisthenic exercise as well and you couple that with good nutrition and regular massage therapy you can make athletes that have a, a much much higher level of performance and a lot lower rate of injury yeah absolutely agreed is that well why do you feel that i mean you're obviously a big proponent of the massage why do you feel that that is so beneficial is it just to be able to uh, get the muscles to perform properly or do you believe in the lymphatic flow proper ph of the tissues why are you such a you know a big proponent because you've mentioned it a few times now well one there's many, many factors, but whenever you're training hard, you get a lot of metabolic waste in the tissues and the metabolic waste is very, very acidic. Research in clinical massage therapy and research from Russia shows that most muscles tear at the musculotendinous junction of the insertion because as you, if you study the capillary beds in muscles, as you approach the connective tissue insertions, you actually have progressively less blood flow. So where muscles inserts to tendons is where you get both a buildup of metabolic waste because there's not enough circulation to remove that, especially if athletes are doing a lot of training. And the most common injuries are at the musculotendinous junction of insertions because that's the part that's moving. So for example, if I'm bending my elbow, the, the insertion to the shoulder would be the origin and the dynamic part would be the insertion. So by treating the muscles and the musculotendinous junctures and doing friction massage on tendinous attachments, you can not only restore circulation, but you can actually undo entanglements in the muscles, which can be felt as, as what's called induration or hardness or inconsistencies in the muscle tissue. You can remove trigger points, which have a very negative effect because a trigger point is a place in the muscle where the tissue is breaking down, but it develops such a noxious impulse that it actually bombards the spinal cord and then it is redistributed through the spinal cord based on a series of laws called Pfluger's laws. But basically, wherever you've had pain before, those neural pathways are already open. So whenever you have soft tissue damage in muscles, it produces trigger points. It actually overflows into other areas of your body where you've previously had pain because the law of facilitation says when an impulse passes once through a given set of neurons to the exclusion of others, it tends to do so on a future occasion. And each time it traverses this path, the resistance will be smaller. So basically what happens is the more tissue destruction you get and the more pain you get, the more the body learns how to be in pain and it dumps the pain into the areas that it already had pain because that's a means of dissipating the pain across the body through a larger system. So it's like attenuation of force. So through doing the massage and keeping the joints mobile and enhancing circulation, enhancing detoxification, enhancing lymphatic flow, also inducing relaxation. And also there's the element of touch. When, when a person gets touched, they feel cared for. Mm -hmm. And so even when it's men working with men and, and you know, in a kind of a high alpha male uh, environment like you know the 82nd airborne division and, and the army boxing team there's still that sense of nurture which has a real calming effect on the body because people feel cared for so there's psychological effects there's emotional effects there's physiological effects there's biomechanical <clears throat> effects uh, there's neurological effects massage can be used to either stimulate or calm the nervous system mm -hmm. It can be used to enhance visceral functions such as enhancing peristalsis or slowing peristalsis down depending on the technique you use. So really there's a lot of ways you can fine tune and optimize performance through massage therapy and decrease overall stress. And it, it's, there's, you know, mountains of research now to back all that up. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I, I completely agree. And, and also it's one of the reasons why, I've studied Ayurvedic medicine in the past, and when you look at that, they have they have more than eight different forms of massage just to do specific things with the human body. So much of it, though, is to actually induce more of a parasympathetic nervous system-based response to actually calm those nerves to allow everything to them be better, digestion, detoxification, sleep, recovery, you name it. Uh, but one of the biggest things, and, and I do want to talk about this because there are obviously pros and cons. I'm a huge fan of actual... 
uh, massage, meaning like meeting with an individual because there is the sense of touch. And I think that there's more to that than we can actually understand yet. I think there's uh, there's the system of polarity. There's the system of my energy transferring with your energy. If my thought behind this massage is to put you at ease or to relieve your pain, there's also that speaking. So I think there's a lot to that. And I would love to hear your thoughts on it. But also, I just know that not everybody is able to take advantage of that because of money, cost, time, etc. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that first from more of an energetic based realm, because I know that you study that, but then also what can we do to get the benefits of massage if we're not able to meet with someone regularly? Well, Jesus in the Bible says, whenever two or more get together in my name, I will be there. How that relates is first of all, most people, even Christians, unfortunately don't really know what the word Christ means. Christ is not a name. It's a title. If you get the meta, Charles Fillmore's Christian Metaphysical Dictionary, he makes it very clear in there. The word Christ is actually a title that means one who is united with all or one who has become one with the universe or has achieved Christ consciousness. As the old saying goes, if you met Jesus and he showed you his driver's license, it would not say Jesus Christ. That would be like saying Jesus CEO. So what he says when whenever two or more get together in my name my name as Christ being one who is united with the universe, I will be there. So whenever two or more people get together in the name of love or a common goal or affection or service to each other or support each other, uh, doctors need patients or they have no living, cops need robbers or they got nothing to do, and massage therapists need clients or they have nothing to do, so we are actually supporting each other. Whenever two or more get together in my name, I will be there. It means whenever we get together in any means that is an, an expression of love, then there is a third created. And the third is the harmony of the two beings or the two souls, which actually creates what Jung referred to as the transcendent function. So the wisdom and the intelligence of the two of you gives birth to a third which is the combination of the wisdom of the doctor and the wisdom of the patient or the athlete or the client. And that has more intelligence and more spirit, if you will, which is the flow of energy and information than either of you two do alone. And because anytime there's genuine love involved, it connects you to that, which is beyond mind itself. So whenever people go see a massage therapist or a doctor or anybody out of love or support or service and there's a genuine heart connection then there is a third created that has the power to guide both of them and most doctors and therapists will tell you they learn a lot from their patients and clients and so I believe in my system and I teach my students don't think that you're just there working on your clients because your clients are coming to bring you gifts and essentially they're working on you because they're going to challenge you to grow and develop yourself in every way, just the way children do when parents have children. So that's the transcendent function or the third that's created. And that is where if we're not careful, our ego blocks the transcendent function and then we become a therapist that dictates as opposed to having a relationship and really trying to get past the symptoms to see what the etiology of the issue is. And, and that's where the real medicine takes place. What you can do when you can't afford massage is you can, there's great books on self massage, but probably the two of the most powerful things you can do is use cold showers, cold baths, and a foam roller. Uh, you can get a foam roller. I use ethafoam rollers because they're hypoallergenic. But you can use a four-inch foam roller or a six-inch foam roller. I recommend both. You can get them right on Amazon. And I have a video on my YouTube channel but uh, which shows how to release the abdominal wall because the abdominal wall and, and the whole flexor chain is something that rarely gets properly treated. Same with the organs. So uh, on my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash Paul Check Lives, Paul C-H-E-K Live, um, anyone can search uh, Paul Check Foam Roller or Paul Check Abdominal Wall Release. 
but you can actually just roll your body out. And I actually just did that right before I got on with you because I, on my off days, I do stretching and body rolling and mobilization and you can get tremendous benefits. It's really gives you the probably as good of a benefit as going to see most massage therapists that don't have a lot of technical skill and you can do it anytime and you can do, you know, spot treatments. So it's in and out. Um, swimming, anytime you're going to go swimming, you're going to get the benefits of hydrotherapy. Hydrotherapy research shows that as water passes over the skin, it not only stimulates the mechanoreceptors of the skin, but it stimulates the hair follicles and that activates the sensory system and the mechanoreceptors and the sensory receptors particularly the mechanoreceptors have a conduction velocity about six to nine times faster than the nociceptive or pain sensitive fibers. So it floods the dorsal horn and the spinal cord with proprioceptive information. And that blocks how much of the pain impulses can get to the brain, which then immediately has the effect of reducing the pain spasm cycle. So ultimately what happens is by being in a, a swimming environment, a pool or whatever you can get into ocean, lake, stream, you're decompressing the body because you're non-weight bearing. So that takes pressure off joints. The pressure of the water, the hydrostatic force greatly enhances circulation, which is why people exercising in water usually have a heart rate that's about 10 beats lower relative to the effort because of the aid of the water in supporting blood return. And then you have the mechanoreceptor effects, which decrease the pain spasm cycle. And because of that, by the time you get out of the pool, you can actually shut down faulty movement patterns and restore biomechanics and enhance circulation and enhance detoxification and get a lot of the same benefits of a massage while also getting effective exercise that has a restorative effect. Yeah, I think that's a great point to bring up because a lot of people assume pool workouts or pool uh, with rehab, basically, they're thinking, well, I, I went in the pool when I had to rehabilitate this, that, or the other thing, which is absolutely true. That's one of the benefits that you can get more of the weightlessness there, better circulation. But what are some exercises that someone could do in the pool? Is it just lap-based swimming or are there other things that they should do? Anything that I tell people, just just keep yourself moving and do it as unbound play. Have no plan. Otherwise, you just add more mental stress to the whole issue so I say, you know, take a kickboard, put it under your chest and just kick back and forth, play with whatever swimming strokes you have, front call, side stroke, back stroke, breast stroke, tread water, goof around, pretend you're a dolphin, you know, just basically be a kid in a swimming pool for 20 minutes. And it can have a very, very therapeutic effect. I think Part of the problem is we've gotten so heady in, in everything we do from, from the way we study and the way we live to the way we do rehab that if you over prescribe people and give them too much technique and too much direction, they get control fatigue and then they just burn out and don't want to do any of the stuff. So you find the best programs in the world aren't getting used because they're giving to, to people too many things to try to think about and control, which is why I developed my work in technologies so that people could get the benefits of Tai Chi and Qigong without having to focus on form all the time. Mm -hmm. I found even rehabilitating Tai Chi masters that they had all the common problems that everybody else did from not knowing how to eat properly or how to stretch or many of the diet and lifestyle factors. They certainly had a good Tai Chi practice, but if you have a great Tai Chi practice, but you don't know how to eat or you aren't getting enough sleep or you're not getting enough working out, you can end up just like everybody else. You just have a, you smile more often, you look a little younger, but you still have the problems that come with just not understanding the essentials that you have to understand to make a body work well. So what I did was studied with a very, very highly regarded Tai Chi master, Master Fong Ha. And I also took training in medical Qigong and I wanted to marry these two things together so that people could do what I call no mind practices where the techniques are so simple, a, a four-year-old can do them. So the point there being is, is that you don't have to have a lot of technical direction. All you've got to do is get in the water and just have fun for 20 minutes. 
And that has so many benefits, you know, and, and as you age, you really feel it. I'm 59. So, um, I've lived through the years of hardcore athletic competition. I've got a body full of broken bones from racing motocross, cliff diving, uh, stock car racing, and all sorts of, you know, (laughs) miracles that I somehow managed to survive through multiple six major concussions, probably about 10 broken bones and internal bleeding and all sorts of neat things. So I've had to meet the pain teacher many times and rehabilitate myself. But as I've, Uh, gotten older I need more time to recover and I don't have that intense drive to constantly you know be a superhero or lift piles of weight but I definitely uh, find that just by keeping my exercise more enjoyable and keeping it simple that I'm still surprisingly strong I mean I, I was deadlifting sets with 405 the other day off a box so you know that's that's worth about 455 off the floor And a lot of the 20-year-old athletes that I train with can't lift what I can lift or do the things that I can do, either out lifting rocks or in the gym, and they're always shocked. But uh, I I really don't train with that much focus and intensity. I just let my body guide me and do what feels good. And I find that if I get a good hard lift in at least every third day that my – my androgens stay high enough that I can maintain muscle mass. And it's a very good anti-aging program in itself. That's great to hear. And and for anybody not watching the video, you're in incredible shape for any age, 59 or not. So, you know, there's something certainly to be said for that. And, and the nice thing is this, is that to me, with all your injuries and everything, you've learned so much through the process. You know, that's why one of the, one of the reasons I wanted to interview is, you is that you just have so much wisdom, so much knowledge, and a lot of that comes from self-experimentation, uh, but also seeing what happens within the field. So now when I hear you say, well, I'm getting a good lift in basically two, three times a week, that makes total sense to me. And then a lot of it is focused on the recovery. It's okay. Well, how do I get my two, three good lifts in per week? Well, it's making sure that you're ready for those two, three good lifts. And that comes with, you talked about the massage, the foam rolling, SMR, the, you know, the, the water-based. Um, what about sauna? Are you an advocate of sauna? Do you use sauna yourself? All the time, yeah. I have, uh, we, we moved five months ago to a new uh, property, so we have 14 acres now. But in my last house, I had an infrared sauna for many, many years. But in this one, they have a Finnish-style sauna where you can put the water on the rocks, and I mix it with essential oils and meditate in there. And even though it's not quite as efficient as an, um, as an infrared sauna for, for penetration, I find just the, just the natural exposure to the heat and the steam um, for me, cause I don't have a heart condition or any reason to need the uh, sort of the lower stress effects that an infrared sauna has that it's absolutely beautiful. I don't have any urge to run out and buy an infrared sauna because I feel that that's fantastic. We have a beautiful swimming pool. So I walk right out of the sauna and jump in the swimming pool. Um, I've been promoting cold water therapies and cold showers and cold baths for probably 15 years long before Wim Hof or any of these other guys were talking about it. So I, I use that uh, for sure. So that's uh, one of one of my things I like to do is vaporize clean tobacco and herbs. It's just something that I enjoy exploring and it's part of my alchemy work. And so uh, I find that I need to get into the sauna every few days just to help the detox system blow that stuff out. Sure. So I think I think saunas uh, are, are an incredible uh, tool for everybody and should be used more often. I think we also need more exposure to temperature variations. Um, One of the problems that we have is people are in such controlled environments all the time is their autonomic nervous systems get very weak. But when you go from a hot environment to a cold environment, your arteriovascular tree is going through some really quite significant shifts. And so you see all this pooling in the feet and the legs of people today, even people that are, you know, in their 40s have the lower legs of old people. And so When you get real cold, as you're getting colder, the autonomic nervous system pushes as much blood as it can to the surface to warm you. But as you go numb, the arteriovascular tree 
constricts in the periphery and pushes the blood into the core, which is what's called a hunter's reflex. And so if you go to the point at which your skin starts to go numb and then get out and either warm, warm the temperature of the water up or go get into a sauna, for example, you get the ar arterial tree opening and all the blood coming to the surface. And as your skin goes numb, it closes and pushes it back to the core, which is really going through a yin yang cycle. And what that does is it actually conditions the arteriovascular system and the arterial system is a muscular system. And we, we totally forgot that we need to keep those muscles in health or we end up with all sorts of pooling, circulatory problems, blood pressure control problems. And that's a component of the human physiology that most people don't even think about, but it's really vital. It's really vital to be healthy, to keep the arteriovascular system healthy. Yeah, I completely agree. And one of the biggest issues is that we can't see these things on the outside. So people tend to forget about them and they'd much rather take their 30 minutes of free time to go out for a run or just something, you know, just to get their body moving. But, and I'm glad that you brought it up because I had a infrared sauna, uh, high end one at the wellness center for about seven years and don't get me wrong. I loved it. I think it's fantastic. And I do promote infrared sauna use. But just uh, four or five months ago, I got a barrel sauna and it's a finish style sauna and you can heat that up to 200 degrees if you want. And I'm not saying that people should because there can be capillary damage in the eyes over time, other things like that with really trying to push the envelope because a lot of people in our society think, well, if 170 degrees is good, well then 225, 250 must be better, but not necessarily for everyone. So what I found though was getting in at these hotter temperatures than I could do in my infrared sauna allowed me to get that vascular effect that you're speaking about sooner. And also when I brought people in, cause I had people up on the weekends, friends, family, I would notice that some people wouldn't sweat. And I said, how are you not sweating that? I keep it at around 175 degrees between 165 and 180, um, at, at head height. You know, the, if you stand up, it'll be around 200, uh, at the top of the sauna, but they wouldn't sweat and they wouldn't sweat till sometimes their third or fourth or fifth sitting. And you can actually begin to show them, be like your body is toxic. And I didn't say that obviously in a negative way, but it's holding on to these toxins. Your body is not sweating. When's the last time you ever sweat? And if you can't open up that part of the process, and just like you said, the actual vascular flow from your feet back up to your heart, you're in, you're going to be in trouble, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, whatever it might be. Yeah. I've experienced that with a lot of people, but usually what that is an indicator of in my observation is dehydration. And, uh, you know, probably 95% of the world population is quite dehydrated. A person that's toxic, the body wants to sweat it out right away. So if the body is holding on to water and they're toxic, it means the body thinks that they, there's a greater survival threat to low water levels than the toxicity at that time. In his book, Your Body's Many Cries for Water, Dr. Batman Gilich says, only 1% dehydration of the central nervous system causes significant psychological disorders. So when you consider that our brain and its function is necessary, critical for survival, because it's the center that integrates the rest of the body, um, if you're low on water and you're toxic at the same time and you're getting into a sauna and not sweating, then your first step towards detoxification is getting your hydration up. And because a lot of people drink water, but they drink water that's either too acidic or toxic itself, um, or they drink water that doesn't have enough minerals in it. So there, you know, for example, there's a lot of the old health experts that used to tell people to drink distilled water, which is a really bad idea because it'll suck the minerals right out of your bones. And it, and I've seen a number of cases of spontaneous cracking of teeth from people drinking distilled water. So in my book, how to eat, move and be healthy. I talk about the importance of adequate minerals and suggest that if you want to drink water that's good for your body, you need a total dissolved solids of at least 300 parts per million. And Avion, for example, is 309. Um, but I keep seeing all sorts of people. I did functional medicine training and testing and tested thousands of people and found all sorts of people that were just A, um, very, very acidic, B, very adrenal fatigued, C, highly toxic, and D, not drinking water that was good for them. And so then you test the pH of the water and that's a lot of problems because a lot of people are buying water filtration systems such as reverse osmosis 
but having tested people's water and, and tested my own water multiple times, oftentimes, I would say 99% of the time people are using reverse osmosis water, it's coming out very acidic, sometimes as, as, as acidic as 5.9. And also, if you don't clean the filtration systems, the filters on the water filtration systems, they can accumulate parasites in them. And I've seen a lot of people get infected by reverse osmosis and other filters because they had the filter in for two or three years when it's supposed to be changed every six months typically. So uh, my point is just drinking a lot of water isn't usually the answer, but drinking high quality water uh, that comes from a clean source and isn't so excessively filtered that you're taking out key information elements out of the water and having the pH right um, is important. So um, also people have this fanaticism over high pH water. But if somebody, for example, is eating a vegetarian diet and they're already quite alkaline, if they drink highly alkaline water, it, it can actually throw their physiology out of balance. And so they always come to me, you know, singing the song of how great their vegetarian philosophy is, but I remind them they're paying me $750 an hour because they're sick. And maybe that it's time to listen to the body instead of getting caught in an ism. No, I, I agree. There's, there's uh, pros and cons to everything. And, and typically the answer doesn't necessarily lie in the middle. It's bioindividualized for that particular client. Um, so just like you said, it's, it's being able to figure out what their underlying issue is. What, so I think, I, I don't know, maybe you don't agree with this, but in my opinion, being able to find pure spring water uh, is the healthiest thing for people to be drinking. But what if, let's say they're, they're you know, drinking average tap water, they need to filter it. Um, we recommend things like a Berkey filter. If they're going to do reverse osmosis, well, then at least add back in the minerals. Uh, but what is your philosophy? If someone can't find good quality spring water and they're not willing to pay for it, what, what can they do? What's the best way to get good quality alkalized, not highly alkalized, but alkalized water with proper minerals and dissolved solids? Well, the thing is, if you're in a situation like that, fortunately today you can go to almost any of the stores like REI, for example, that sells camping equipment and you can get very decent quality filtration systems so that people, when they're out camping, can just take water right out of a stream and you suck the water right through the filter. So I tell people regularly, just get yourself a high quality filter from a camping supply place. And even if you're walking through the airport and they got a drink fountain, you can fill it up right there or you can just take tap water and put it in there. And then you can just add Celtic sea salt or real salt, which is a brand, a good, a really good brand or any high quality salt because it has the trace and elements from the ocean. And it's usually got up to 40, 40 minerals in it and trace minerals in it. So, you know, if you look at this science of salt, there's what's called the mother liquor. So high quality salts like Celtic sea salt, sometimes when they come, they're actually moist inside and that's the ocean. And so there's research on salt shows that there's up to 40 trace elements from the ocean that are uh, micronutrients for the body and adding salt to the water alkalinizes it. I teach people how to connect to their soul or use muscle testing to determine when they've got enough salt. But I tell you, uh, right in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, if you can taste salt in the water, it's too much. So each person can explore, and usually it's one to two pinches of salt in a liter of water. And I tell them, don't just get in the habit of doing the same thing, because for example, if it's hot out or you're doing a lot of heavy training, there might be days where your body needs three pinches, but there might be days where your body doesn't want any salt. So you have to constantly engage your own body's intelligence instead of just getting into the sort of a recipe routine. So the other thing you can do is you can charge the water by just taking stones of a variety of different colors and creating a circle of stones and setting the water inside the circle. And then whenever moonlight or sunlight hits it, the yin stones absorb the water or the light like a sponge and they sweat it out and the yang, the brighter stones, project it like a flashlight. So you actually create almost like the nodes of Ranveer in the nervous system. So you get an alternating charge that's propelled by the sun, by the moon, and by the electromagnetic energy of the earth and the environment. And if you can put that circle of stones on grass or in your garden, if you have access to that, then the, the life force energy 
of the microorganisms also is being pumped into the stones. Uh, so that's a very simple technique that uh, I actually build great big giant water chargers. I'm building one right now that's going to double as a sound chamber. And I can probably put, in this one, I could probably put 40 or 55 gallon bottles of water in it. Uh, I've been at it for about a month building it now, and it's going to be about nine feet tall. But I teach classes on how to build water chargers. And typically I put about, I build them big enough to put three or four or five gallon water bottles in it. And it does magic stuff to the water. In fact, on the full moon, the water has so much energy. Most people think it's carbonated. And on the new moon, it's so empty that it feels like a solvent. When you drink it, it feels like it's going right through your tongue. It literally feels like it's passing right through your tissue. So it's very great. New moon water is extremely good for detoxification and full moon water is very good for energizing the body. So I, those are some of the things that I teach and that I practice. Um, but water is such an important thing. Really, we have a, a huge, huge problem in our culture and worldwide with the use of straight pipes, copper pipes. And basically the research on water shows you can kill it by doing that because in nature, water always moves in a serpentine fashion and it's never held still like that. So there's things that are called flow form technologies. You can get Rudolf Steiner developed flow form technologies. Victor Schauberger, who's one of the world's foremost experts on water, developed flow form technologies. There's charging systems. And actually one of my students gave me this, which I think he invented. And he put stones inside of the bottle and they're gemstones cased in glass. So you pour the water in there and it charges the water up right in your water bottle. So there's, there's a number of technologies. There's companies that make water vitalizing systems that use anything from gemstones to creating vortexes in the water. Um, the best water to drink, if you can get it, is artesian water because artesian water comes up on its own because the earth has cleaned the water and energized the water. And having experienced water from the moon cycle and correlating the water tastes and effects and f feelings in my body with the moon cycle. I think that uh, when we get artesian water, we're getting water that's been prepared by nature and research by um, park rangers and people studying animals have shown that animals will walk miles to get to a artesian wells. They inherently know that's the best water to drink. So my first choice is always an artesian water. The second choice is spring water. And I recommend the website findaspring.com, which shows you where to find uh, spring water all over the world. It's a great resource, without a doubt. And it's one of the ways that also led me, I'm actually drinking, this is a main artesian water from a, a tourmaline uh, spring. So they call it actually sacred living water. It's supposedly still, obviously it has all of the minerals, the dissolved solids, uh, but it also has that charge to it. And, and I can notice that actually the water, if you begin to become more self-aware, like you're preaching right now and talking about, you can actually feel the difference. You know, you can feel how it tastes in your mouth. You can feel how it touches your tongue and how it energizes your body. If your body actually wants to absorb that or not. You can also use an amazing affordable technology called biogeometry. And I have a podcast with Dr. Ibrahim Kareem, who is the creator of biogeometry. And his, he has what are called home kits. And he has a technology in there called the cube. And since we moved in, I haven't been able to finish my water charger. But when I got his cube, it immediately started structuring all the water in the house. And it sits on my counter right next to my water bottle because I get water from Palomar Mountain, which is a 4,000 foot well right here on Palomar Mountain, where, right where the observatory <laughs> is. And that water has been tested and found to have absolutely zero impurities in it, which is very rare, not even nuclear fallout. And because I'm very familiar with what charged water feels like and f how it affects me, I was really missing my water charger. So I got his cube, which is part of the home kit, and within one day, I went, wow, my water's charged again. So 
what it does is it takes electromagnetic pollution from the environment and converts it basically to the frequency of the earth and power spots. He studied pyramids and power spots all over the world. And as a scientist and an architect, he was able to use his knowledge of radionics, subtle energies, architecture, geometry, and various other sciences to produce these very simple technologies. In fact, he's, he's actually been called in by the uh, Swedish government because when they put cell towers in, they, they had uh, animals that stopped reproducing, people that were getting sick, people were coming up, kids with seizures happening all over the place, and they didn't know what to do. And he brought in and using geometrical forms within one week, all the illnesses were gone. The cows started producing milk. Um, the people, the animals went back to normal and the people were literally threatening the government to dynamite the uh, cell towers and, until he came in. And so he describes how he makes that technology and the science behind it in my interview with him, which is w probably within the last four weeks is Dr. Ibrahim Kareem and Doria Kareem, his daughter, who is also a genius. All of his kids are involved. And so that's a, a beautiful podcast that actually is going quite viral right now because he's, this guy is very, very wise and very intelligent and has come up with very simple solutions. So really, when you look at the kind of money people spend on medical expenses and, and silly stuff, just garbage food, Starbucks, stuff that has no significance in their life, you can get a home kit for $250. It will not only change your whole house, but in, enhance your sleep quality, your regeneration, and structure your water. So that's a technology that I would say people should really look into. And you can find it at biogeometry.com. I'm going to check that out. Actually, if you can see behind me, I have one of the Soma Vedic um, glass uh, ceramic-based uh, jade cubes and that works on the it actually it, it does help with the structuring of water but it helps with um 5g cell phone towers producing its own scalar waves so that your body absorbs that wave more that of the hertz of the earth rather than that of the emfs and electro uh, radiation but i want to check out this the biogeometry one as well because i'm very interested in um being able to promote these things as much as possible so that that's great to hear that you have good personal experience working with that as well well, listen to my podcast. You will know immediately you're in the presence of a extremely wise, well-developed, highly spiritual, scientific human being. So I'm going to link up today in the show notes today. Well, obviously your books, a bunch of things, but I'm going to link up that uh, foam rolling SMR based video, especially in the abdominal wall. And I'll also link up today. Um, the biogeometry and people, hopefully they've been listening to my podcast for a bit now and they've heard about the findaspring.org, uh, but I'm going to link that up too, because that's priceless for people to be able to grab a bunch of uh, ideally glass if they can, uh, three gallon or five gallon or whatever they have, fill up at a local spring and then just simply disinfect that water, uh, which you can do fairly easily. Yeah. I think it's findaspring.com, not .org. All right, we'll link that up for sure, without a doubt uh, today. So that's great to hear. And one thing, uh, and I'd like to touch more on this as well. So, because I want to hear more too about your story. Did you immediately begin to go into more of the holistic path um, when you started in the fitness-based arena? Because obviously you're working with athletes. How receptive were they to this type of information? Like, was it just about body transformation? Is that how you kind of made your way in? Or were you always interested more in the holistic side of things? Well, you see, I understand the question, but I was raised holistically. True. So my mind didn't, I always looked at other people and wondered why they weren't doing the things that I was raised doing. And I played every sport I could play as a child athlete. And I come from a small farming community. And whenever we played teams from the city, we just destroyed them. They just could not handle the work that we could put on them. And, the, and, the, and, and our, we were just too strong, all this farm boys. And we all ate real food grown by our own land and our own hands. And so, plus my mother being a yogi, um, and being trained by monks and learning to meditate as a child and, and all these things. So, you know, I also learned 
various other spiritual practices. So I, I would, whenever I would have patients and people came to me from all over the world, they still do when nobody knows what's going on with them. And sports teams would hire me because they'd have, you know, elite, very high paid athletes sitting on the bench and nobody could figure them out. And it would almost always be very simple, basic stuff that doctors never put any value in. And then, so they would be scratching their heads. Like you're telling me that all this is happening because this guy's not pooping. Yes. You know, so um, when I would have clients, even with my assessment skills that were so complicated that it was hard to really make sense of where to start with them, I would just go into meditation and ask my soul to connect me to that person's soul and guide me. And I would just sit there and empty myself. And then I would begin to see images, almost like watching videos or I would hear inside of me a voice that said, ask them about their relationship with their spouse or ask them about their pain in their relationship with their father. And inevitably I would be led right to the bullseye. Mm. So I, I didn't outwardly talk about uh, the techniques I was using until students were advanced enough to uh, have the mindset to realize that the guy that was telling them this wasn't a nutcase but I would demonstrate to them through the ways that could get their attention, like, you know, out lifting them and out running them. I I've taught many professional sports teams, how to lift weights. And it's very rare that anyone could outlift me. And that would shock them as well. And I would tell them, you're lucky I'm a therapist. I took a take your job if I wanted it. No. And that, that's what I was alluding to because in the beginning you were writing books about tennis and golf and some muscle building and ab abdominals. Like I think you were, and I'm just wondering kind of like getting people's attention that way to then hopefully, um, get them to buy in, to understand, like, you know what you're talking about. And now there's another level to this. I don't, cause I just wanted to see if that was correct or not. Cause it's what it seemed that you always had this knowledge. And of course it's been built up over the years, but you needed to get people to understand. Yes, you know, all of that too, but then here's the next level. Yeah, I teach my students a, a philosophy of coaching people that is this. I say, always tell your client what they want to hear, but give them what they need. Mm -hmm. What they want to hear is exactly how what you're asking them to do will help them accomplish their stated dream goal or objective. Yes. So if you're going to tell uh, an elite athlete, uh, put salt in your water or um, meditate or whatever it is uh, or use corrective exercises that to them look silly, like with a blood pressure cuff to activate their core more specifically. If you don't show them in clear, simple language or use diagrams or something so they can actually see how does doing exactly what Paul's asking me to do actually contribute to the bottom line of what I came here to get, then they're not going to follow it because oftentimes those types of things are so out of the consensus reality that they feel unusual or insecure about doing them in front of people. For example, when I developed my work in technology, I would teach athletes, look, you can do this with a barbell. You warm up all the time anyhow. So as long as you can use a weight that's light enough, that's not going to accelerate your heart rate or your breathing rate and time your breathing to the movement, you're actually doing Tai Chi in the gym and people just look at you and think you're warming up. So I said, the secret is you need to get a weight light enough to get somewhere between 30 and 60 repetitions with it. And if deadlift is what you want to do, then do deadlifting Tai Chi. If it's bench press, do bench press Tai Chi. If it's lunges, do lunge Tai Chi. So I really showed them how to be aware of the response of the respiratory system, heart rate, and to monitor their tongue. Because as the body goes sympathetic, the tongue starts to dry out. This is why a lot of us notice that when we're running hard or training hard, our mouth gets really dry because the, when we're parasympathetic, the tongue, the glossopharyngeal system is actually part of the digestive tract and it tells you how parasympathetic you are. So I tell them, you should be able to do this on a full stomach 
It should not increase respiratory rate. It should not increase heart rate. And you should leave feeling like you've got more energy than when you started or you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. So ultimately what I'm saying is I try to a make sure that they have a rational understanding of why I'm asking them to do it, how it affects them, how to do it, and then how to cloak it so that it doesn't look so unusual or esoteric if their ego is fragile enough that they need to fit in. For me, sure. I don't give a damn what people think. <laughs> <laughs> I think in the beginning, right, a lot of people have to, you know, first work through the ego part of it before they they feel comfortable enough. But the reason I, I like that answer as well is, is you just want to make sure that you explain why you're asking them to do something based on their goals. We have a lot of integrative health practitioners listening to this, and, and it's very important because you can know what to do and and um, your, your client or patient may not know specifically why you're asking them to if it's a little bit out of the ordinary. So I, I think that's, you know, excellent advice, really good advice. Um, I'd love to be able to ask you right now because it, it is one of those topics that I want to get to. And I want to make sure that I get this right. So you are a registered Native American spirit guide and medicine man with the uh, Nemenaha band. I don't know if that's correct. And the Native American. Okay. Tell I me was. a little bit about that. I'd love to hear how you got into that. Yeah, I'm not anymore because the license used to give me the ability to use any natural substance in a healing ceremony, which included mm -hmm. mushrooms, uh, various cactuses, so things that had psychedelic properties. But they actually changed leadership and had a restructuring and restructured it. So you're not allowed to use anything that's considered to be uh, a scheduled drug anymore. Uh, so it gave me a, uh, originally for the first probably eight or nine years I was part of it, it gave me um, a legal protective envelope to allow me to use plant medicines in my uh, healing ceremonies. And I've conducted uh, probably over 400 healing ceremonies in my career using plant medicines. So that was why I joined the um the, the, the Native American Council is to get that protection. But I have been shutting, studying shamanism for a very, very long time. I've done extensive research with plant medicines on myself. I have a lot of experience using them in healing ceremonies, both for individuals and in groups. And people come to see me from all over the world who have been injured by the ineffective use of psychedelics, be it taking too much LSD or over, you know, doing the mushrooms or going off into the jungle to see some shaman and just having their mind scattered so heavily, or oftentimes they pick up entities from people in these group ceremonies and very few people know how to help them uh, heal those types of problems. So what happened for me was, is that in uh, around 2005, maybe 2006, one of the famous athletes that I work with, who's, you might know who he is, Danny Wei, he's the famous skateboard star. He's the guy that, he jumped the Great Wall of China on a skateboard. Oh, wow. And he's set the world record. He's set 10 Guinness Book of World Records now. He came to me when he was 19. He'd been told by the medical system he would never be able to ride his skateboard again. He had a, quite a bad spinal cord injury up at C1. Mm. And uh, I rehabilitated him in four months and he won his first contact contest back and he set 10 Guinness Booker World Records since then. But he found a medical doctor that uses plant medicines to help people heal. And he had a very profound experience. And so do, did his brother and his brother is the owner, was the owner of DC shoe, which is, you know, world famous. They sold their company for a hundred million dollars to Quicksilver. But um, Damon had a brain injury um, and he was partially paralyzed and couldn't walk very well. And so I worked with Damon and Danny and Damon got to the point where he could ride his motocross bike and stuff again. And they both had such profound experiences. They said, Paul, you really got to go see this guy. And when I did, I had such uh, an incredible experience of complete union with, with all that is that I immediately sensed this is something I need to study. So I did a year of training with that doctor but that didn't give me any legal protection. So I then joined the Native American Council to get the protection. And so because 
when you really like I've been doing this for 36 years and people have come to me with every kind of problem you can imagine um, from physical to emotional to mental to spiritual. And what I found early in my career is that most of the approaches, even in physical therapy and manual therapy are only treating symptoms. They're not actually getting to the etiology. So what I did early on is I started noticing that it was that all behaviors are the results of beliefs. And the most common source of beliefs is religious programming. So I kept tracking people's internal stress, whether they had cancer or chronic reoccurring back pain or whatever, back to what is the belief that they keep empowering. And I found so often it had something to do with religious programming that I spent many years studying world religion, comparative religion, philosophy, science of mind, uh, how the brain is programmed. I studied brainwashing so I could understand how people get uh, washed, brain, brainwashed, which shouldn't be called washing because you're getting programmed into a belief system. And so what I came to realize is that it takes a long time through conventional means and standard approaches in psychotherapy to actually deal with a lot of these issues. But with plant medicines, you can get right to the core of a lot of these things in one ceremony. And so I was able to actually help people with eating disorders and all sorts of problems such as cancer that had reoccurred by using the plant medicines in a properly run ceremony because it, the plant medicines break down the default mode network, which is really the brain circuits that make the ego and they allow the unconscious to flow into consciousness. So things like sexual traumas, mental, emotional traumas, um, personal issues, self-esteem issues, judgments, fears, um, insecurities, uh, belief system problems that aren't serving them anymore, religious ideas that aren't serving them. Fear of God is extremely common from people that are raised in churches. And so I found that because people spend a lot of money to see me and come from all over the world, it was my duty to actually continue to, to this very day, to continue to try to find ways to help people that are highly effective and highly efficient. And I had such radical healing. I've had a very traumatic upbringing and childhood and a lot of death in the family. My brother committed suicide. So when I started doing my work with plants, uh, healing plants, uh, medicines, it brought up all sorts of stuff that was trapped inside of me and, and allowed me to see it where before it was in the unconscious, it was working in the background and the unconscious mind is, is extremely powerful. Bruce Lipton says the subconscious is, is, uh, I think he says a hundred times, if not a, a thousand times more powerful or more than the conscious mind. But because things are unconscious, you need a mechanism to see them. And so the plant medicines bring that stuff right up. So I've been able to help people that had problems their whole lives and nobody's been able to get to the core. I've had people with eating disorders that have resulted in extreme trauma and bulimia and anorexia. And in one ceremony was able to get right to the core and identify exactly what needed to be healed and completely knock these things out. So that was really why I pursued the path. No, I th and I think that's a noble cause as well. And the nice thing is, so you've known this now for many years, but as I'm sure you've been keeping up, um, you know, in the medical literature and the studies as well. Now we're saying, okay, that all of that is true. That one specific ceremony or session with psilocybin has been able to help people with deep, severe depression. And it lasts for six months. And that's from one dosage of psilocybin. So I, I'm looking forward to obviously, uh, well, I'm, I'm hoping that now more people in the medical-based industry um, hear about this. But the truth is that 
it always gets a little bit ruined whenever conventional medicine gets into it. And that's the problem is that we don't allow then the plant medicine to work how it's supposed to, because now it has to be patented. It has to be used in this specific way. And a lot of people miss out because of it. So it's too bad that, again, you have to use it safely because it's not being used safely everywhere uh, in terms of um, psychedelics and plant medicine, but for people that know who know what they're doing, and especially passed down from thousands of years of shamanism or Native Americans, um, they, that should be allowed. I mean, it really should. So it's too bad that that kind of got overruled for you. Well, we we uh, we should have complete and total sovereignty of our body. Nobody should be able to tell us that we have to get this vaccination or that vaccination or uh, take this pill or any of that and to, to tell people that it's illegal to eat things growing in nature is, is an absolute infringement on not only our rights as human beings, but on our freedoms as Americans. And it just goes against the principles of nature. That would be like telling chimpanzees it's illegal to eat bananas. You know, they, if they had enough brain power to question you, they would certainly think you weren't very intelligent. And many of the great Native American Indian chiefs like Seattle uh, Chief Seattle brought this up uh, very strongly when when white people tried to take their land and put them on reservations and were killing buffalo left, right, and center and being completely destructive. And so, you know, having studied this very, very extensively, um, you can pretty much see historically that uh, medicines were used ceremonial in ceremony for ceremonial purposes to break the ego down and bring us back into connection with the earth and back into connection with the plants and the animals and back into connection with each other, which is extremely important as a means of, of basically putting the ego in its rightful place so that we didn't become too greedy and too violent. And when those ceremonies started getting extinguished and you see we're, we're, we're now some say in the third wave of the psychedelic revival, but whenever we find that we're in trouble situations like we were during Vietnam, then you had the great big, you know, LSD craze and, and, and marijuana. And we're, we're going through a, a big transition right now. And we're in our third wave of, of the psychedelic revival, because if we don't, come back to nature to get to the real medicine chest, then the statistics are not very good right now. I mean, we got a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety, a lot of suicide from what's going on in the world right now. And uh, I think that the good news is there's so many people like uh, Rick Doblin and, and uh, Dennis McKenna, who's carrying the torch for, on from uh, Terrence McKenna and Ram Dass was a great pioneer, and Houston Smith, and many really highly intelligent people that have done a lot of research, and Stanislav Grof. I mean, there, there, there's a lot of great genius minds and doctors out there that have really shown us that these things are, you know, bordering on miracle drugs if they are used in an intelligent way, in a ceremonial setting but like everything you know the, the you know there's an old saying the way you do anything's the way you do everything's people that can't handle money can't handle sex can't handle food can't handle power so it's just the nature of human beings to be like little children that mess up and and don't do things intelligently but if you actually handle these things as sacred medicines then you get sacred responses. If you handle them foolishly, then you get foolish type responses. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's a popular thought on this essentially that says uh, we have two camps of people, the people who are all for it, people who are all against it. But the problem is that um, if you're against it, that you're looking at it from only one perspective of what could go wrong. You're not understanding of all the things that could go right. And you're also looking at it sometimes from preconceived notions of people that abuse alcohol, that abuse uh, cigarettes, that abuse anything. But you can abuse anything. That's the whole thing is like you were just mentioning, like there are people that who abuse certain things and don't abuse certain things. And that doesn't mean that necessarily we shouldn't allow people to have the option to use these things, especially since they are going and growing out in nature. When on the other hand, 
people can be addicted to prescription drugs uh, prescribed by doctors all the time. And yet, you know, somehow that's, that's okay. Well, so that's okay because it fits their business model. Well, that's you know, it. <laughs> David, David Bohm, who's one of my heroes. Are you familiar with David Bohm? I'm not actually, no. Uh, David Bohm is one of the most amazing uh, theoretical physicists and, and quantum physicists that ever lived. He, he uh, worked with Einstein. Um, just search David Bohm and get your mind blown. There's a great documentary on his life on YouTube right now. Um, but David Bohm said something quite profound. He said, real thinking is hard work. That's why most people just rearrange their prejudices and call it thinking. And that's where you get all this negative backlash against the plant medicines. And a lot of their opinions are propaganda that were programmed into them by the Reagan uh, administration, the Nixon administration, the war on drugs. But really, that's not the war on drugs. That's the war against the drugs we can make money off and control. And when you look at the effects of plant medicines on the ego, they have an effect of softening the ego and opening the heart. When Albert Hoffman invented LSD, he had a feeling that it might be effective as a truth serum. So he sent it to the Pentagon and, and the United States government to test. And they thought, well, we better test this on some elite soldiers. So they took a team of Green Berets and they put them all on a, on a LSD journey. And when they came out of the journey, every one of them wanted out of the military because they realized they, had, they all had the experience of connection to God and to wholeness and to what life was really about. And they didn't want to kill people anymore. And that triggered a backlash because they could not maintain nationalism and the corporate interests of the country if everybody was using these substances. And lo and behold, alcohol, cigarettes, and sugar all do the opposite. They crystallize the ego, and people love to fight like crazy when they're on alcohol. And if you're a soldier in a battlefield, you can drink yourself to death, you can smoke yourself to death, and you can put all the sugar in your body you want to. So what you see is all the drugs that are legal support nationalism or support the agenda of the state but most people are so out of touch with what their tax money is doing and why these wars are getting started because they're falling victim to the same brainwashing that we have going on right now that's causing us to lose our freedom of speech and to have great doctors and therapists taken off the internet that are telling the truth about all sorts of things mm -hmm. so you know the reality of it is you can't do effective thinking until you honestly look at the evidence on both sides and anyone that looks at the scientific research now available on plant medicines comes quickly to realize a lot of the things they've been told are not only wrong they're so wrong that it's dangerous yeah and i appreciate you bringing that up and i would even say there's one more too anything that's legal right now and one of the reasons why i believe they did fight cannabis so much is that the drugs that are legal are the ones that make you forget that they palliate and that they basically make you shrink back inside rather than doing some real true introspection. So, um, and that's, that's what the world is looking to do, right? They're looking for people that aren't going to question, uh, but rather palliate their emotions and, and drink away their, you know, yeah, they want to pacify are. people. Uh, they, they want to pacify you just enough that you don't ask big questions and don't realize that you're in an invisible cage and keep you just angry enough and polarized enough that you'll support war efforts because the military industrial complex is one of the largest business industries in the world with probably some of the most power in the world. So when you realize who I tell people, we don't have a government, we have a corporate headquarters and it's time to wake up. And Adam Smith, who is regarded as the first real economist warned anytime you get corporate interests or business interest in government, you have a very serious problem. He said right in this, because I've studied his autobiography, his bio, I mean his biography, he said, anytime I was in business meetings with government where corporate interests were involved, they had no concern for the effects of what they were doing on people, only about making more money. And he said right there, it's extremely dangerous to let find people with personal financial interests into government because it will ruin the entire country. And, and here we are. Without a doubt. And that, that's hard to, uh, that's hard to argue against. So 
I want to I want to bring it back to what we can do, how we can empower ourselves and our communities to do the things that we need to do in order to begin to heal at a deeper level. So with all of the knowledge that you've been able to accumulate, and and I do want people to get started with a book. Um, well, I, I'm a book like How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. I think it's an excellent book for people to be reading. I have actually recommended it before on the podcast. But what's some of the work that people should be doing like to start? So sure, people want to lose weight, transform their body, but I want to go deeper than that. What are, what's a good first step to, in order to be able to start to heal? Um, maybe they don't have access to plant medicine, but that they can start to do some of this work on their own. Well, I think one of the things that we have been so... Uh, programmed into is all this fear of infectious diseases. This is contagious. That's contagious. Wash your hands. And without a long elaboration on all the things you already know about how damaging that is to the immune system from mask wearing to washing hands, uh, you know, that's based on a very outdated germ theory. But what we have to remember is that health is also infective. Happiness is infective. If you go see a real shaman, they're going to ask you five key questions. And the answer to those questions will tell you very accurately where your illness began. Hmm. Question number one, when did you stop singing? Question two, when did you stop dancing? Question three, when did you stop enjoying good stories? Question four. When did you stop enjoying being alone with yourself? Question five, when did you lose your sense for the awe, the magic, and the mystery of life? Well, when you look at what were the events that led you to stop singing, dancing, enjoying stories, being alone with yourself, and enjoying the magic and the mystery of life, you will see where your trauma or your brainwashing got put into you. And the answer is, Sing more, play more, give yourself unbound play. We've been so programmed to measure ourselves constantly by achieving some kind of result. But we forget that in order to live a balanced life, you have to have as much worship for the unrational, non-objective as the rational, objective, outcome-oriented aspects of ourselves, or we die of logic and rationality, but life... Love is never rational. Children are not rational. Artists are not rational. Musicians aren't rational. They're not sitting there trying to make songs that fit some sort of a formula that's socially correct. The great people that bring in a new myth are the artists, the poets, the dancers, the musicians, because they're tapped into something beyond the rational mind, which is the soul of the universe. So, I start with people by saying, let's get clear on what happiness is. And that's why I have my four doctor model. Dr. Happiness is the chief physician. Most people have forgotten to include practices that are happy making in their life. So when you find out that you're not singing, sing. There's an old song. Um, happy people may not sing, but singing makes you happy. Mm. So, when we're children, we sing naturally. And when you sing, you use the vibration of your own voice and it resonates through your whole body and has a healing effect on you because you're singing out of joy typically. And even research on Tibetan monks shows that it actually has a purifying and cleansing effect on the cerebral spinal fluid when they chant and do toning. So Dr. Happiness really means that you have to get clear on what is happy making for you and schedule time in your day and in your week specifically for the practice of creating happiness or you forget how to do it and you become a statistic and you'll spend a lot of your money on drugs and doctor's visits and you'll spend a lot of time standing in lines and in waiting rooms deteriorating and then you get low energy and you spend all sorts of money on garbage like Red Bull and five hour energy and tons of coffee and you just burn yourself out. Most people danced as children, but now they're so afraid or so insecure, but you can dance in your bedroom. You can dance in your shower and you can dance without thinking about it. And it brings you into the unrational and opens the door to ecstasy. 
enjoying good stories and telling good stories. That's how we entertained ourselves before we had all these electronics. There was nobody more valuable in a tribe than a great storyteller. And that's how we educated ourselves so we can enjoy good stories. I love after a, a busy day at work to find a good movie or something that I can just enjoy and have no attachment to it other than just giving myself the opportunity to either read or listen to or watch a good story. And when we engage good stories, we learn how to be a good story. We learn how to tell a good story and we learn the art of storytelling. And that's really the best way to educate children. When you, when you get to the point where you don't want to be alone with yourself, then you never learn who you are. You never really get in touch with your feelings, your wants, your needs, your desires. Therefore, you can't have healthy relationships because how can you know what you want in relationship until you know what you want in relationship to yourself? So a lot of relationship problems actually get blamed on the spouse or the other without realizing you're projecting your own biases, your own fears and insecurities onto somebody else because you're afraid to or unwilling to spend time with yourself. And all you got to do is sit alone in a quiet, dark room and all these things will start rising up. This is why float tanks are so good because you don't have to take a drug. You can just go lay in a float tank and have all sorts of profound experiences such as rebirthing experiences, vivid dreams, even voyances can turn on. So then if we lose sense with the magic and the mystery and awe of life, then we really don't realize what a miracle it is to be alive. And when you look at the fact that it takes the entire universe to create each one of us, and you got approximately 100 trillion cells, each of which is made of 100 trillion atoms, all working in some kind of an amazing harmony, and none of us knows how we digest, eliminate food, circulate blood, swallow, chew. I mean, yeah, we have some idea from science, but the, the amount we don't know is vast compared to what we do know. So paradoxically, we call that the unconscious mind what regulates all that, but it's really should be called the super conscious mind because our conscious mind is completely and utterly dumb. In fact, it's our conscious mind that keeps destroying the body and forcing the autonomic nervous system into such terrible stress so if you spend time alone with yourself and you do things like listening to your heartbeat, which all you got to do is lay in a bathtub and hold your breath for a few seconds or just put your head back so your ears are in the water and you can hear your heartbeat resonating through the tub. And then you can say, who's playing that drum? And just hold the question, who is making my heartbeat? What is making me breathe? And all of a sudden you will come to the point in 10 minutes or 10 days or a year that the entire universe is involved and that all of us are an expression of the whole and that we should all get out of bed every day completely excited to share our wellness infection. And I think right now we all need to get back in touch with the truths of ourselves and the beauty of ourselves and the depths of ourselves and the intimate connection to nature that we have because we're unconsciously destroying everything that is necessary to keep us alive from the soils to the airways to the waterways etc because we're too busy uh, chasing the next iphone or the next video game or the cool car or the cool house on the hill without realizing we're losing the whales we're losing the fish we're losing the barrier great barrier reef we're poisoning everything in the name of technology but those technologies aren't making us healthier healthier and happier they're making us sicker and the rate of drug addiction and drug abuse and suicide and physical and mental and emotional disorders is shooting through the roof and our children are in the worst shape they've ever been in the history of man why all in the name of science well there's no better science than the science called nature and all you got to do is spend time with your feet on the ground and listening to the birds and seeing the beauty all around you and singing, dancing and painting and having more fun and practicing happiness. 
instead of watching the bad news hour and believing all that garbage that's designed specifically to get money out of you and keep you caged because you're highly profitable when you're sick and confused. Paul, that was one of the most powerful uh, explanations of how to begin to heal the body at the deepest level. And I really appreciate that. Uh, more profound than I think many people will realize until they begin down this path. And then you'll understand that, you know, all the supplements, all the water purification systems, all the saunas, all these great things will not touch being able to work at a deeper level inside of your body at that vibratory level, at that soul based level, however you want to describe it. So Really appreciate you being on the podcast, the show here today. Uh, it meant a lot to me being able to hear uh, you say these things in person uh, over this over this video based call. And I would love for people to be able to, for my community, reach out to you, connect to you on social media, your website. Um, how can they reach you? Uh, the best place is c h e k institute dot com. Uh, we have a social uh, platform where we share a lot of uh, videos. Uh, audios and all sorts of neat stuff, not only from me, from my, my instructors, all of who are very amazing people, which is chikiva.com, C-H-E-K-I-V-A. Uh, my podcast is loaded with um, absolutely amazing interviews with people like Ibrahim Kareem, Irvin Laszlo, and many geniuses and great people. And that's Living 4D, number four, capital D, with Paul Check. You can find that on iTunes or the Check Institute website. I have over 550 videos. That's my donation to public wellness uh, on YouTube, which is youtube.com forward slash Paul, C-H-E-K live. So youtube.com forward slash Paul Check live. Mm -hmm. um, we do have an Instagram um, thing on, I have an Instagram channel, but I have staff do that. Cause I found that I can't, um, engage too much social media without losing my ability to be an effective father and creator. And so, uh, we do have a lot there, but typically that it, people come out and film me and then they post stuff on, on an intermittent basis so that I don't have to be overwhelmed with mountains and mountains of digital technology. Um, we, you know, we have a beautiful 14 acre property here with a great big pond that we can canoe on and fish in and hiking trails and sauna and swimming pool and have a beautiful gym. So I really do my very best for all of us. And we all spend time in nature a lot and try not to get too trapped in the world of information technology because it can easily become a very dangerous trap. So I try to find a balance between all that stuff. Well, I, th I think you're doing a fantastic job and keep it up. Once again, thanks for being on the show. Really appreciate you. My pleasure. It was great, great discussion. Thanks for the great questions and thanks for all that you're doing for the world too. I think we, we're, all, we're both invested in sharing a wellness infection. That's right, we are. <laughs>